Hey everybody, uh, Robert Dunt, founder of Art10.com, and here I am today at the Press View of the Rachel Whiteread exhibition. Basically, if you don't know much about Rachel Whiteread, first woman artist to win 1993 the um, Turner Prize. Basically, what she does is her sculptures are made using the technique of casting with materials like plaster, rubber, resin, and concrete. But unlike traditional cast sculpture, which is intended to replicate objects, White Tree's work instead of cast from the space inside or around everyday forms, such as furniture or boxes and architectural structures like floors, staircases, or entire rooms. So she kind of records their surface and allows their shapes to determine the form of the sculpture. And in this way, as so the blurb says, she explores the human imprint on our everyday environment. As you go in, the first thing you really notice that's different to most of these things is that there's no walls inside the exhibition space. It's just like one massive room, which is kind of quite freaky and um, quite refreshing as you're normally corralled around your little guided way through the thing. But it's just one big space with all the stuff lying around inside it and I guess you know you've got quite a sort of architectural ceiling in itself so that architectural elements of the work all come out contrasted against that. The other thing that's quite different is that for once you haven't got wall after wall telling you what's going on which I think for an artist like this is actually quite strange as um, you could almost do with reading or something about it. I know she's described as a sculptor but in some ways I'd be tempted to say she was um, less of a sculptor and more of a conceptual artist. Okay, so these appear to be the earliest uh, kind of works from 1988, I think just a year after she graduated from the Slade. Um, and these are casts of uh, different things. Uh, so I think uh, a mantelpiece, possibly a closet and a torso as you know, that's the torso, it looks more like a um, hot water bottle, and that would appear to be a mattress. Um, I quite like the holes in the mattress, it's quite funky. Look at those, go right through it. I suppose that's quite nice, you get a sense of shallow breath, that's called. You get a sense of the weight of the mattress as a sculptural object. And I guess that's magnified by those holes going through there. Okay, so quite a few of these ones here, also reasonably early, seem to be like bits of bathrooms. So this is actually quite cool. It's like a, it's like the casting of a sink. So I mean, I'm not sure what the bulkiness around it is. Uh, I guess that's just to sort of push it up on a plinth. But uh, that's a, a sink, and uh, over here's a, what must be a fireplace. And over here is a uh, bathtub. So this is quite cool, the, the reverse bathtub. It's pretty cool. I suppose it's difficult to see. She obviously seemed to rise to fame very quickly. It seemed to be a year after leaving the Slade that she started doing these things. It's quite hard to tell. I guess it's a sort of the way they talk about her and the curator to her is sort of a darling of the art world. I suppose it's got a sort of intelligence to it and also it's incredibly sort of dry and reserved essentially and I suppose the art world loves a bit of it loves a bit of dry and reserved reserved colours it's all very aren't we clever let's a bit mean pat each other on the back and say how we all understand the genius of these things I guess it gives a perfect opportunity for everybody to uh, yeah sort of join a little elite club of don't we know about the works Rachel Wright Reed makes, aren't we clever? I suppose what is quite nice about these things is like this is like nine tables that if you saw it you might just think it was like nine sculptural things on the ground but obviously when you read it's nine tables and then if you look more closely you can see the sort of imprint of the tables in it. It is, I suppose what's clever about it is that it works on a level such that Anybody can look at it and anybody can see that imprint and everybody gets a sort of mental moment of genius when they look at it. Which I suppose is, I mean, it, it's actually for something that is sort of almost abstract, quite communicative. 
I'm not really going in order here. These are some uh, papier-mâché pieces that they kept talking about how they'd literally just come from a studio days ago. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're much the same thing, but made out of the papier-mâché. They're quite pretty, though. They've got some uh, little colours in them. Uh, that's possibly even some bits of newsprint or something. Um, actually remind me of the sheets that um, art handlers wrap your paintings up in. Uh, there is a bit of colour in quite a lot of these things, you know, reserved, obviously. This sort of um, pinky violet on a sort of casted, well, this is sort of resin, sort of resin cast of a door. I suppose it's quite cool where you, there you can see like the lock on the door that's sort of been inversely cast. And then um, you've got more of these doors over here, um, which are quite funky and not so enamored by the thing on the ground. I'm sure it is a cast of something, but it reminds me so much of all those other things you see laid out on the ground by other sculptors. Um, I actually quite like this door over here. I think it's kind of cool. Um, it's just got a really, it's got a nice color and it's got a nice sort of shimmery depth to it, especially with the repeated sections. Anyway, here's another door that's quite cool. With a, it looks slightly slanted. And there's another door here, it's quite nice. You can see the lock uh, section and the post box. And then you've got another, I'm not sure what this is, probably a window. Um, you can see you've still got the colour, you've got, you have got a modernist thing going on, sort of those squares and shapes put together, you know, a clever play on harking back to those modernist uh, kind of things in a way that's contemporary. And this is quite a cool, different one, kind of black one, oh, quite reflective, this black one. It's quite funky. I know, oh, yeah, I don't know what it is, they sort of, they like me, that's a little bit about it, but I mean, it's slightly irritated. Um, they're very, very clever, but I suppose, and there is stuff to look at. Visually, I wouldn't say they're devastating. It's all just so controlled and reserved and everybody in this press view is so quiet normally there's people sort of interviewing each other but everyone's just sort of creeping around today um it's a strange thing it's um it, could it be a bit more fun i suppose these are well, i suppose these are sort of a bit more fun these little um mini casting things like that must be like a coke can um to go down here this is like sort of loo rolls um all different colours. I think this is one of my favourite uh, bits so far, which is like a casting of like a library. Um, so you can see the sort of inverse spaces where the books have been. Um, I actually think this one is quite cool because in your mind you can sort of transfer yourself back to that library and see what's happening. It's actually quite... Um, that one I think is quite clever. It gives you an out-of-body experience to a library. And also there's a sense of it being like a library. What I can't help wondering, wandering around, is how this is really going to work with uh, like normal punters coming in. Because I mean, I mean they, they're, they're all clever, these things, but partly just because it's all in this giant room and there's very, very little explanation on the wall. There's normally millions of things for people to read. Is how are these, you know, if you just wandered in off the street, how is this going to affect you? What are you going to experience? Just don't know, really. I think you could find yourself a little bit lacklustered or a little bit, um, almost a little bit confused, actually, because it's so restrained, um, the explanation of what's here, that, I mean, they're cool things, but it's not easy to find out what's really going on. Even the little booklet is um, slightly abstruse. There's stuff in it, but it's not like pouring information out to you. Here's more of these things that are uh, described as torsos, which are, as I thought, having read the book, um, hot water bottles. Um, I mean, they look to me like coloured hot water bottles. Um, described in the book as um, unassuming sculptures that nevertheless have an enormous emotional resonance. I mean, I just don't think they do, frankly. I mean, they're just, they're just... That's quite a nice modernist, colourful thing, but I mean, I really don't think there's an enormous emotional resonance to uh, to these things. If anything, I'd say it's an intellectual resonance. I mean, anyway, that's how 
It seems intellectual. I really don't think it's um, <laughs> got this emotional uh, resonance. But obviously, they want to. They want to talk about that. Once these things are in the art canon, they've kind of got to be defended by everybody. Um, here's some drawings. Um, their drawings. Which, uh, you know, they're not too bad. They're fine. Um, I like this one with the graph paper, it's quite nice. It sounds a bit mean, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the drawings are kind of sketchy, they haven't got a, they haven't got a sense of a real draftsman. They're not incredibly um, technically drawn or laid out. This one's a bit nicer up here. I mean, they're not like those Bridget Riley drawings you look at, which are incredibly detailed and organised and have a real, you know, presence to them. Um, you've got a David Hockney photo collage up here. Um, that's quite nice, this is quite a nice little collage, quite like that one, with a little bit of paper put on it by the windows. Um, things like this just, just, uh, just don't do it for me, I mean, it's all quite loosely drawn, it, it looks a bit chaotic in some ways. Um, okay, this is one of the bigger pieces here, there's like two big pieces, this I'm presuming is room 101, it's quite hard to tell. Uh, if it is, but I guess it is, because it seems to be a plaster cast of a room. This was a room in the British Board Broadcasting Company's headquarters, where novelist George Orwell worked there during the Second World War. It's believed to inspire room 101, the Chamber of Horror, and Orwell's dystopian masterpiece, 1984. Rachel's cast of the room is all that remains of this literary artefact. Ah, oh, I mean, I know it's clever, I suppose. It's, what is it? it's almost like a documentation of the thing. Um, it's clever, but it is desperately over-dramatised. I, I think a lot of this stuff is just added on. I mean, it's very clever to make a cast of the room, and I suppose it adds what British sort of public like, which is a narrative to the thing, as opposed to just uh, being able to appreciate it on the, the visual level of it. Um, it's a cast of a room. I suppose it does make you think about that room. I suppose that's when it works best. I think, actually, it works best if you think of it as a sort of you know, sort of psychedelic, hallucinatory experience of seeing these things twisted out back to front. I think that's quite good. That makes your brain revolve these things. This seems to be a casting of some stairs. So it's, it's pretty cool. You've got inverse version of stairs. Um, but I can't help feeling that what's written about it in this book is not really quite right. And it goes on about, it goes on about how it bears witness to the comings and goings of daily life. Um, the scratches and cracks on it, I can't actually see any uh, scratches and cracks on it. Um, capturing the physical marks, the artist was able to comm commemorate the former residents of the building. Well, I don't think so, really. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic, extraordinary sculptural piece that I don't think it does any of those things at all, though. Um, I can't see the scratches, unless I'm looking at the wrong piece. But, yeah, it's a cracking sculpture, but the rest of it is um, with absolute rubbish, frankly. Here's a few more pieces. Uh, I feel strangely insecure today. I normally uh, enjoy being in galleries, but for some reason I don't quite like it today. Um, I can see somebody else from another art well, a magazine or art website who I had an argument with on Instagram where they're talking about how wonderful Gerhard Richter is and how nobody should ever criticise him and it's one of those things where you get the feeling they, they're all chummied up in the art world and they're here giggling and laughing and chatting because I guess it really is a sort of chummy art world um, exhibition basically. Um, and you know, it's all like, let's, you know, we're all in on the inside of it, aren't we? Brilliant. Um, which obviously is absolutely not what Art Top 10 is about. It's about art for everybody, giving it back to the people, not um, sneaking it up into a little found enclave for people who like to think they're intelligent can then pat each other on the back. I don't think, I mean, that's obviously not why she made these sculptures. That's certainly not why um, we should be experiencing them that way. Quick wander through the shop. Uh, 
What is that? Wait, is that a bag? No idea. Is that an apron you can buy? This one's actually a, I like these ones out in the real world. Uh, Showing these places. They almost look better when they're outside. They're less, um, almost like real stuff can affect them instead of just this huge amount of sort of uh, loveliness thing. Um, there's some videos and then there's more stuff outside. So that's outside of the actual exhibition written in the Tate itself. There's some more stuff that's going to have a little look. Call me old fashioned, but I still think this Barbara Hepworth thing is absolutely stunning. It's just so. I mean, you've got such control in those little wires, the way they're put back and forwards, you've got the beautiful colours, and it's not monumental, and not some of her stuff obviously is, but I mean, it's. it seems quite human. Um, it feels like it's talking to you, and I uh, don't know, I'm not sure some of these things do. I think a lot of these things are just too clever. There's a lot of people who enjoy that clever man. I just heard somebody walk past going, there's something very sexual about Rachel's work. I mean, I just can't believe the stuff these people come out with. I mean, maybe I'm just mean, but it just seems a little bit extreme. I mean, I find it incredibly dry, the work. Um, anyway, here we go. Down here, we've got all these uh, coloured sort of soap block things. I was looking at them earlier, I mean, okay, it's very cool, it's nice inside the room. I think the colour's frankly a little bit drab, but maybe that allows people in the art world to think about the sophistication of the reserve to colour use. It's funny actually just wandering through the rest of the Tate, having a little browse as I'm here. Uh, looking at this Ben Nicholson, obviously I like things like this Ben Nicholson. And this is obviously like a sort of weird cubist abstract still life. And it did make me think that I suppose what Rachel Whitehead is trying to do, she's trying to do like still lives. And, but what I like about the things like Ben Nicholson is, is it is simple. I mean, maybe at the time it was all arrogant and clever, but I mean, there's a sort of humility and simplicity and... I'm sure Rachel Wright really does have a have that sort of humility for the object and a, a sense of what she's thinking and looking at, but something about it just um I don't know, yeah, I'm not sure it's the work itself, I think it's just the the vibe I got in the press view today it just rubbed me out the wrong way. It's all very um just a bit cliquey, just a bit art world, just makes me feel utterly alienated from it. Um I mean is it a part of a clink you really want to be part of? Okay, so here we are outside where there's a uh, uh, this little shed, I think it's called Chicken Shed. Um, matched up rather beautifully with that lovely Barbara Hepworth. Um, What's a bit mean, but it doesn't actually look brilliant out here. It looks a bit odd. Like, uh, uh, it's a slightly strange plastic thing that's uh, not perfectly put there. I mean, the Barbara Hepburn is so beautiful and made. I don't know, this is oh, it doesn't actually look like it's been made very well, the chicken shed. Um, anyway, I don't know, the whole chicken shed thing is getting on my nerves. It's not sort of purposeful. Choose something so simple to deal with. Anyway, uh, obviously I'm having a bit of a, a weird day today uh, about what I'm thinking about everything. Anyway, so there we go. Uh, on the way back from Rachel White Reed. Um, on the plus side, I think you've got to say, she communicates incredibly well. Uh, simple, but, you know, mentally powerful sculptures like the chairs or the tables. You've got these sculptures there, then you realise it's the sort of inverse of what's there, and in your mind you can see those chairs stacking up, or those tables stacking up, or those library books. And it's an easy, simple, um, it's a really simple way to get people to understand and look at the world in different ways, I guess, and uh, see things in different ways. It's clever. It's really, really clever, and it's simple, and it's brilliant communication. Obviously, I uh, found today really weird. Didn't enjoy it um, inside that press view. It was quite strange. Normally on the press views, uh, there's a curated tour at Light 11. Uh, they show you all around, talk about it today. It's a bit weird, like the whole exhibition, just all this stuff in a giant room with minimal explanation. I'm not normally into the explanation, but I think something like this needs it. Um, it was just left there, as it were, for you to experience. And I think people will find it exceptionally hard to really integrate um, 
engage with that show because it's just oh, lots of stuff that's essentially quite similar in the room, um, in a massive room. Um, uh, I think people will find it hard, and uh, weirdly enough, the curators didn't actually take us around and show us or talk to us about any individual things, which I thought was really strange. They answered a few questions, but there was nothing like discussing how she progressed. They just kept talking how there were a few new things that had just come out of the studio. It, it, was, it was very strange. The, the curator tour mimicked the whole um, sense of the exhibition, just all this stuff left in the room. It was a bit like, the curators are like, here it is, have a look, um, which I thought was strange. Um, if you've created the thing so carefully, why not explain more about how and why and the way you decided to place the things, what the reason was for placing it, uh, how you saw people progressing through the exhibition, things like that. Um, the exciting though, the nice curatorial thing is that it's just in the big room, which is different and is interesting, but I'm not sure it uh, works, maybe. I'm not sure it's easy uh, for people to understand. Also, the other thing, I think, weirdest about today is I, I felt strange in there, didn't like it. Uh, while I was filming, uh, some guy was sort of saying, oh, there's somebody filming something. Um, it was strange. It, it really was felt today, it was like this art world clique was out today. There weren't a lot of people at the uh, press view. Um, not like David Olney, it was just full of people. It was all a bit cliquey art world. Uh, slapping each other on the back, wandering around. Anyway, that's what I thought. Maybe I just had a, a weird day, but there was something about it that it just wasn't right, and I'm glad to be out of there and away from it. Um, anyway, it's an interesting exhibition. She's obviously an interesting artist. It's worth going to see it. I think she probably ticks primarily the boxes in the art world. People just love having something they can be clever about and chat with each other. And, Oh, they've known about Rachel White for years before she's ever been here. Um, but anyway, it rubbed me up the wrong way, and I didn't like it. I don't think that's what art should be about. And the weird thing is, it's left me thinking more and more about what I would want to be in the art world and where I'd want to be in it. You always think, you know, you want to be a successful artist, you want to be recognised, but ugh, that just didn't seem right. Um, I was thinking, you know, I've always been a fan of the Jesus and Mary Chain, partly because of their difficult attitude, and I think their difficult attitude caused them a lot of problems in their career. But obviously, people liked their music and bought it, so they had some power. Um, but, uh, um, and I think they rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way, Jesus and Mary Chain, because they hated the music industry, and they criticised it all the time, and they didn't do what they were meant to do, and they didn't sit around saying, oh, I really like these things, when they didn't like them. They said what they thought. Um, and I think the art world is somewhere where yeah, I have a feeling if you're in the depths of it, there's nothing you can say out of line. And people are so stuck in it, they're actually horrified if people do say things that are out of line. I mean, it's always felt like that in the art world, that you don't dare do this, you don't dare do that. And I mean, here you are, meant to be in this creative environment, it seems to be the most restricted one you've ever come across, which is just absolutely bizarre. Anyway. More than anything, it just makes me think, do you want to be part of that world? I mean, you want to make pictures, you want people to look at them, but do you want to actually be part of that art world? And I don't know, probably, I don't know. If you can burn some bridges and tear things down and change it, it would be fun, but I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people brutalising you in that process. Anyway, there we go. Rachel Whitery, obviously worth going to go and look at, but I would just try and enjoy it for what it is. And um, I guess you won't get the same atmosphere. It's uh, just going to go around and see it. But I'll be interested to see how many people go and what kind of uh, reactions it has. Anyway, as ever, please like the channel, subscribe. What I love about YouTube is that you don't have to get permission from anybody to put on. Well, you don't have to, um, you know, it's, it's an open thing. People like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. You don't have to have somebody telling you it's okay to go and do what you do. You just do it and stick it up. It's, uh, Sort of democratic thing. Anyway, as ever, like the videos, subscribe, all those things, please. Be really helpful. Okay, cheerio. Bomb buckler.